So Futera, over the years, over the 22 years we've been going, has always been extremely dedicated to positive change. And a couple of years ago, we decided to set ourselves a mission that would just absolutely blow us away, a mission that was inconceivable, a mission that challenged all of the way that we were feeling emotionally about the future. And the mission that we set ourselves was to make the Anthropocene awesome. Now, this has caused some controversy, mainly around the pronunciation of Anthropocene. Um, uh, lots of lots of debates internally. But the reason, the reason why we decided to set that goal for ourselves is because we felt like we were spending our whole careers holding back the worst. Holding back the worst. And that can erode you. That can, that can grind you down. Whereas, in fact, actually what we wanted to do was dedicate our careers to the best and to trying to make things actually better and leaving the world, ourselves, our relationships, our friends, our families in a better way. And I could not uh, imagine a panel that I would wear this um, uh, that would be better to have this, discu this discussion with than the panel we're about to have. Um, a panel of my gurus. Um, and I'm gonna put my job, my glasses on to make sure I pronounce my guru's job titles appropriately. So first of all, I would like to invite Sandrine Dixon de Clerve, the co-president of the Club of Rome, to come up and join us. Sandrine has been uh, both a shiro and a dear friend of mine now for some time, and it's a great honor to have her here at Solutions House. Sandrine, please come up and join me. <laughs> Wherever you wish, maybe at the, at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll put the boys in the middle. Um, I would like to invite Jamie Bristow, um, the Public Narrative and Policy Development Lead for the Inner Development Goals. Now, Jamie has done many, many other things which I've, uh, which I've followed over the years, but I'm really excited to hear about the Inner Development Goals. Jamie, can, please come up and join me. <laughs> We've got Dr. Stephen Posner, um, the Director of Pathways to Planetary Health at the Garrison Institute. The Garrison Institute, not being a native New, New Yorker, is something that I've been finding out a lot about this week and really excited about the work that they do. So Stephen, if you will come up and join me. <laughs> now, we also, uh, sorry, whenever anyone claps, uh, Taggart gets very overexcited. <laughs> she, just, she just assumes it's entirely for her. Um, <laughs> which of course it is. Um, we also were due to have um, the most amazing uh, uh, Michael Dorsey join us, uh, and he's been drawn away uh, for a very exciting reason, which we'll um, explain on the panel. And so in the spirit of it, it being Friday at Solutions House, and Solutions House being all about answers only, um, I just asked one of our attendees to come up and join us here on the panel, you know, spotting him across the room, you know, and I'm sure this uh, spontaneous last minute panelist uh, may be familiar to a few of you, so I'd like to invite Paul Hawkin, founder of Project Regeneration, to come up and join us on stage. <laughs> now, um, before I hand over, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Sandrine to go, for, to go first, but before I hand over, um, for those of you who attended the previous panel, you may notice a little difference between the previous panel and this one. The previous panel were pretty much all under 25. Uh, <laughs> oops. Um, uh, hey, we're about to celebrate the 50-year anniversary of the Club of Rome. Come on. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and a very diverse panel. And this is that we are not a diverse panel. We won't be diverse in terms of our thought, but uh, it's, let's have a conversation about that whilst we're on this panel, um, particularly in terms of uh, our movement and uh, how our movement has been representative or not over the past year. So let's make that a central part of the conversation. But first of all, Sandrine, um, uh, the Club of Rome and the work of the Club of Rome has been fundamental over uh, genera literally generations um, of change makers. And I, I double checked because I, I saw in the notes that the, the seminal work, the um, Limits of, to Growth, is coming up to its 50th birthday, as am I. Mm. Um, and uh, the Club of Rome was uh, published the year before I was born, which uh, either makes it old or me young. Um, and 
just thinking about the, how influential that has been. And then much more recently, how Earth for All, with the five major transformations that you have identified within that, has been equally transformational. And just thinking about almost these sort of two extraordinary moments in time with limits to, for growth and then Earth for All. And perhaps you could just reflect for us a little bit around what you're hoping Earth for All might achieve over the period of time um, that's to come next. Thank you, Sully, and um, welcome, everyone. I, I think that uh, what we need to remember is that in between the publication of The Limits to Growth, there were many incredible people, members of the club, but also scientists, economists from across the globe that continued to remind us that we were going far beyond the limits of our finite planet. And unfortunately, when you look actually at the limits to growth, and you reread, which I do actually almost every year, because it reminds me just how stubborn humanity is in terms of not listening to what's in front of all of us and not thinking about what that really means in terms of our own existence. The limits to growth showed that by the 2020s, we would be hitting a series of tipping points. It's really quite phenomenal when you go back and you look at the work that was done then. Huge computers, I mean, it was the first time actually that we were using computer models for system dynamic modeling. Incredible team. But the fact is, half of what is happening today, we already saw then. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do with a great deal of humility mm -hmm. is say, we're not gonna celebrate the limits because we have nothing to celebrate. We've been stupid enough, we as human beings, to not, and politicians and big business, to continue with this profit, power, we are the ones motive, and going far beyond the planetary boundaries. And therefore, we need to rethink. So, we rethought, and we put together a group of incredible system dynamic modelers, but we knew that we couldn't just deal with the data. We had to then translate the data into reality, bringing in economists from across the globe. And that was the other key aha moment, was we realized that actually, especially economic models are being developed predominantly by the West, in particular those that want to shift from an extractive model, so unbelievable work by Kate Rayworth and others, but still not bringing in indigenous knowledge, not bringing in actually some of the incredible southern knowledge from across the globe, trying to bring all that in, stress testing our data, and then building a movement from it. First a book, which now has been translated in 10 different languages, including in Chinese, though we are not always quite sure what was really translated, but we think it's okay. <laughs> um, but most importantly, and I'll end with this, after all of that reflection, knowing, and you're the storyteller, and this is why I love your book, by the way, I'm just going to do a little pitch for Sully's book. <laughs> Wanting to remind us that we needed to bring forward solutions within the reality check. I believe no pain, no gain. No evolution in our thought, in our actions. We will not be able to actually get through this mess. So... What we wanted to do was to do the storytelling through the book for women, different continents, demonstrating the difference between the two scenarios, the giant leap, and obviously the too little too late, and thinking through the five key turnarounds of poverty, inequality, empowerment, food, and energy, and what does that mean then to truly get us to a well-being economy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what we've truly done is built not only a narrative, but a movement. Mm -hmm. We now have five countries that are trying to implement the work of Earth for All within their economies, including Ukraine, who have asked us to rebuild, sure. which is quite, inc I have a team of 10 people, by the way. <laughs> um, so we're thinking through how we can really do that realistically. But then we have symphonies. So a European youth symphony that has actually done a new symphony based on Earth for All. We have festivals, cultural festivals, we have academic institutions that are including this into their academic programs. That's what we wanted. We didn't want this book to sit on a shelf. We wanted this book to create a movement. Beautiful, and I believe that it has. I think, can we have a round of applause for Earthfall? Because it is an extraordinary piece of work.
And if you haven't taken a look at it, I, I very much recommend that you do. And the whole point of this panel is to reflect on the outer world, on the systems and structures, the society, the, 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 the massive, massive global infrastructure that we have built around us and how we've been doing on that and how we haven't been managed to transform that. And then also to uh, set that alongside us, these messy, wonderful, complicated, confused, glorious, terrible human beings that we are. Um, uh, I often reflect on the fact uh, that we probably know a great deal more about climate science than we do about human consciousness um, at this point, that the neuroscience of humanity still eludes us whilst the very chemistry of our planet is becoming clear. Um, and Jamie, the work that you've done um, on the inner development goals to attempt to think about the fact that is it possible for us to make these transformations to the outside without transforming the inside is a very, very interesting question. Yes, indeed. And it's a, it's a question that actually goes right back to the founding of the Club of Rome. Um, thank you. Is that better? Yeah. So, um, so yes, this is a question that goes right back to the founding of the, the Club of Rome. Um, because it's, is it Aurelio Pecci? Is that how mm -hmm. you pronounce his name? Aurelio Pecci. Aurelio Pecci. Um, who, one, one of the principal people who founded the club. Uh, back then, he, he, he saw the predicament that he already seen the predicament back then as one that involved inner and outer dimensions. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called The Human Quality, um, which I recently read on a, our kind of mutual colleague's recommendation. And in that, he really focuses actually primarily mm -hmm. on the messy uh, qualities of the human heart and mind that underpin the, um, the systems that we're in. Um, and, and, and frames that as fundamentally what needs to change, as well as the external, the roads and the energy system, etc. And the, uh, the, the Club of Rome, uh, the Limits to Growth report, didn't so much focus on that, um, partly because I think nobody has focused on it. You know, that, that, that um, and, and the um, Earth for All report is a really sophisticated um, uh, Yes, summary of where, of where we are now. Um, and it needs to be complemented with a, with, a, with a pathway of mindset shifts, of culture change, of individual and collective learning and transformation. Because although it's been treated as a, an external, physical, and technical problem on, on the whole, as if we knew how to address it with the, um, with the solutions that we, that we already have, I mean, on, in one way, we do, but we haven't acted. And why is that? It's because it's a a, an adaptive problem rather than a technical problem. That means that the way we're thinking about the problem is part of the problem itself. It means that people trying to solve it are part of the problem itself. It means that learning and transformation are part of what needs to happen. We don't quite know how to, how to deal, deal with it. We're sort of learning on the job. And in, in order to be equal to this challenge, to the complexity of the world that we've created, we need to, to grow, to mature, to develop individually and, and collectively. So the, the Inner Development Goals um, is a, an NGO that's sort of two or three years old, um, framing the, uh, the, the, the slow progress on our sustain, sustainable development goals as partly because we've been treating it purely as an external problem. And that actually there are, um, like there are 17 SDGs using input from 4,000 experts. We've um, created a framework of 23 IDGs, things like inner compass, complexity awareness, compassion, um, and mobilization skills, how you, how you sort of motivate others. Um, and, uh, and, so, and, and, and the other um, thing I'd love to um, share with you today, which was sort of in the, in, in the write-up, is my, my, um, my previous work um, focused on one part of this inner development landscape, on the, on the capacities that you can sort of diligently train in over, over days, months, years, that can not just make you a, a little bit more able to respond, but can actually radically transform the heart and mind. Um, and my, my background was um, 
working with British politicians, 300 of which have now been on a... <laughs> thank you, Sonny. 300 of which have now... Just, just think Madonna. Yeah. Use <laughs> <laughs> your microphone. <laughs> yeah. 300... They wouldn't be able to see my face, though. My... <laughs> um, so, so, so uh, yeah, 300 politicians in the British Parliament have now been on a mindfulness training programme. And uh, they have... I mean, last week we published a report documenting their words on how it has helped their personal, interpersonal, even cultural lives in, within Parliament. Helps them to disagree better, right? And so it was... It, that's what they say. Disagreement's important. And Mike, Mike's... Okay, disagreement's important. Um, robust dialogue and debate is important, but polarization, breakdown of communication, etc., not, not so healthy. So, so um, it was out of this work um, that we turned our attention to, to the climate crisis and, and last year published the Reconnection Report. And this is what's been driving my interest in this inner domain since I worked in a climate change campaign 13, 14 years ago. Um, and uh, in order to, to look at, you know, first of all, it was clear, so little work had been done on the inner dimension of the climate crisis. We needed to sort of start from scratch. There's no policy reports about this. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with probably the leading professor, Christ Christine Vamsler, mm -hmm. at the, um, the Lund um, University Center for Sustainability Studies. And, and together we interviewed um, over 100 uh, of the experts working in the area and politicians uh, working in the field. Um, and we said to them, if you talk about the inner dimension of the climate crisis, what, what do you say? How do you frame this? And we got, you know, uh, from the 100 experts, you know, we got 100. Okay. <laughs> well, that really needs to be close. Um, we got 100 different stories, almost. Um, but amongst those, uh, there was this narrative starting to really um, come through. Um, and, we, and rather than having 100 different stories, if, if policymakers out there are going to hear us, we kind of need to have um, something of the same hymn sheet um, so that this isn't sort of dismissed as, oh, yeah, you're into mindfulness or you're into, um, you know, different aspects of this. And um, there's probably maybe 15, 20% of, of experts using one particular narrative. And uh, it was actually reading Paul's Re uh, Regeneration book, and in the introduction, he sealed the deal, really. This was, this was the narrative that we were going to back. Um, and he very clearly said that the climate crisis is perhaps most fundamentally a relationship crisis. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that relationship crisis can be understood as a crisis of disconnection. Disconnection from self and the nature and from the world, but also from ourselves. And actually, these things interact with each other really and like, so, for instance, empathy, we might agree that empathy is important, you know, caring about or feeling for caring about those on the other side of the world. But that is underpinned by connection to our own bodies. Because when we are attending to the feelings of others, we're actually listening to ourselves. We're listening to how our bodies are responding to this person in distress. So if we, if we like many of us, are kind of separated from our, from our minds and use our bodies like a vehicle to go from meeting to meeting, we haven't got that full range of empathy. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the Inner de Development Goals, I would strongly recommend that you do so um, when you've got a little bit of time to sit and reflect on them. Because uh, unlike many things that we deal with in our, in our space, they are not merely an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so, Stephen, I'm going to come to you next because in many ways, the work of the Garrison Institute over so many years has been attempting to do this, sort of even before we had the Inner Development Goals. <laughs> um, so perhaps you could tell me a little bit about what you're doing and, and reflect on uh, Sandrine and Jamie's points. Yeah, thank you, Solitaire. Thank you all for being here, too, and for all of the great work that the two of you are leading. And I'm going to ask well. you to do a Madonna as well. Yeah, <laughs> is, is this a little bit better? OK. Yeah, so the Garrison Institute uh, is all about engaged contemplative practice. So we integrate what we know from science with what we learn from contemplative practices across all traditions. And then we use that to engage. We look to link what we know with what we do to inspire action. Um, and it's wonderful to have Deanna here today. She's one of the co-founders of the Garrison Institute, current board member, so thank you for being here. 
when I think about inner and outer dimensions of what we're talking about today, I, I think about what happens if we don't integrate the inner and outer components. And sometimes the response to a crisis can be the crisis itself. I'm quoting Bio Akomolafe here, uh, but the way in which we attempt to solve the poly crisis can in itself become part of the emergency. Uh, and if we're not in tune with the inner world that the action is inspired out of, mm -hmm. then the responses can be very disruptive in themselves. Uh, what happens when we do integrate the inner and the outer dimensions? Then I think we have the opportunity to ground what we do in our intentions and our motivations a little bit more coherently. And I think that's a great opportunity. I think it's overlooked. I think it's, in a way, common sense mm -hmm. to, uh, to be in the consciousness together and not with as much of a conscience, but a little bit more of, of, a, of a conscious approach to solutionism and, and solving the problems. And I'll just uh, I'll quote Carl Sagan as well, because uh, I was at an event called Sea Change last week, and his name came up quite a bit. I have a degree in astronomy and physics. I'm a huge fan of Carl Sagan. But back in 1985, he was giving testimony to Congress. And in that congressional testimony, uh, almost 40 years ago, he very clearly articulated the science and what we know about climate change. Uh, the, you can find the video online. It's only about 10 minutes. At the end of it, he wrapped up by saying, what we really need here is a global consciousness. Beautiful, thank you so very much. That was a mic, don't drop the mic, but that was a mic drop moment. Um, uh, also, uh, tag it, we'll try to eat it if it's on the floor. Um, we will take some questions from the audience in, in a moment, including questions online. So for those of you who are online, please do um, put your questions forward as well. They'll come up for me on here. But I want to come to our spontaneous special, uh, thank you so much for stepping in, uh, guest. Um, uh, so, Paul, many of us have followed your work for many years. We've, uh, we were inspired by Drawdown. We've loved your most recent books. Um, and, you know, I've heard you speak a couple of times, so I'm going to ask you a question that maybe I haven't heard you ask mm. before. Um, we're talking here about the outer and about the inner and about uh, what it takes, perhaps collectively and individually, to be a change maker. Can I just ask, what keeps you going? Like, ha I've, I'm talking to a lot of youth climate activists who are burning out and are desperate to know, like, how do you keep going? They don't want to burn out. It's not a, it's not a point of pride. It is, it is putting question marks over their ability to finish their degrees, their ability to go out and to get jobs. And they want to be able to keep going in this movement. They know this movement needs them. Um, and they're coming to me and going, how? How are you still standing? So I've got a, that question for you. How are you still standing? Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> well, one reason I'm still standing. You can have the Madonna mic. I'll have the Madonna mic. Uh, one of the reasons I'm still standing is because I'm leaving soon, you know, and I think there's a... <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, you know, because youth are new arrivals, you know, and they're talking to the people who are leaving soon, saying, what were you thinking, or were you thinking at all? Which is a fair question they're asking. Um, but first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Garrison. I was privileged to be a part of the Garrison board for 10 years, extraordinary organization. I want to thank Diana and Jonathan and Stephen for being there. Uh, and I do urge you to get involved with it in some way. It's close by, not far. Uh, it does amazing work. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in terms of what keeps me going or whatever is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, less than 1% of Americans, in fact, one, less than 1% of anybody in the world is doing anything on a daily, weekly, monthly basis about climate. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is after 50 years more of knowing full well that action needs to be taken. So I think the question is, are we blaming the 99%? Are we blaming the messaging, the story? Mm -hmm. And to me, it's the story. And the story that youth are hearing would drive anybody into anxiety, panic. I just am talking to a mother whose daughter committed suicide. Climate anxiety suicide, not just any suicide. So 
our narrative is absolutely, I'm sorry, it's just guaranteed to create inaction, to create polarization, to create all the things we're seeing and in, in, in so forth. So I really want to compliment everybody in the panel um, <clears throat> for changing that narrative. Um, the, um, let's see something. Uh, I, I would like, <clears throat> in, in Jamie's, um, I, I just met Jamie right there at the elevator, <laughs> and he said something about the first paragraph or the first page on regeneration. If you don't mind, I would like to read to you the first paragraph of my new book, which is not published yet. It's called Carbon, the Book of Life, and it's attempting to try to weave its way through I would say <clears throat> the ossified climate narrative, you know, uh, and um, so with your permission. Oh, if it's a paragraph, yes. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, it starts with Bayoakam Alefe too, you know, who I think, you know, we should be listening to him and not Al Gore, frankly, but that's mm. my opinion. Uh, and this is him. There are things we must do, sayings we must say, thoughts we must think that look nothing like the images of success that have so thoroughly possessed our visions of justice. So that's how the book starts. And it says, I'm probably like you, I don't know what is happening. I take in the news, the science, the confusion, the broken politics, a world unfurled, at wit's end, shrouded in shallow certainties. To better understand the riddles and the luminosity of life, I widened my gaze. I chose to go to the source, far upstream, to headwaters, and look through the lens of carbon and the flow of life. I listened to those who see a planet unlike what is conventionally assumed. Might there be wisdom domes as well as heat domes? I found an emergent offshoot of homo sapiens, women and men merging deterministic Western science and observational indigenous wisdom into a different understanding of our place on earth, a perspective that reveals what we do not know. Certainties are dissolving. They are being replaced by unfathomable complexity. Though carbon comprises a tiny fraction of the earth, a planet without carbon is a dead rock in space, like a sky without stars, a symphony without sound. Carbon is a courier that courses through every speck of our existence. Follow it, and you will find an interwoven lattice that permeates cultures, lagoons, mines, grasslands, organisms in our temporal life. There is an indigenous adage, do not take sides, only then can you see it all. And, um, but this came from uh, my observation, of, and we talked about the elevator, Lindsay, and I've, I'm, I don't know your first name, I'm sorry. The, the gentleman there, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we were talking about carbon, I was saying, you're talking about offsets, and I was saying carbon should not be sold. Making a marketplace in carbon mm -hmm. is ridiculous. It is the same mindset that causes the problem. <laughs> You know, which is that, you know, we used to sell people and elephant tusks too. How did that work out? I mean, it's not going to work to make a marketplace, you know, of the dilemma that we're in, you know, and so forth. So, uh, to me, what I wanted to do is take carbon and, and make it much bigger and widen the gaze. Not to make anybody wrong, not, not, not at all, but to actually expand the sense of possibility and the wonder and the awe and the extraordinary thing that we call life is a very f bad four-letter word in my opinion for something that's so extraordinary, but that's the word. And that's what's missing in the climate dialogue, in the climate, you know, uh, and that's what's missing here in Climate Week, frankly. Uh, mm. And it's my first Climate Week and I dare say it'll be my last because this isn't where the conversation, I'm not saying where it should be, it's great if it's in New York, but the conversation that's being had here, you could have had the same conversation six years ago. Mm. I mean, I, have, I can't hear any change at all. In fact, hardly even in the speakers, you know, and so forth. So we call, no, no, I mean the back there. <laughs> 
and we call that infectious hepatitis, you know? And, and so, <laughs> so, so going back to youth and so forth, to me, it's about story. It's about narrative. It's about seeing a world that's very different than the one that they've inherited in terms of the narrative. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for um, thank you for showing us the beginning of your book. How exciting! You heard it here first, um, Sandri. I'm going to come back to you on a couple of things, um, and then we're going to go open to the floor. Um, firstly, on this sense of what's changed, has anything changed? Um, and I'll say it here at Solutions House, there has been some conversations that I hadn't heard before, but we're a tiny venue of course, so it's different to some of the other stages. Um, and I also, again, want to bring us back to this panel. Mm -hmm. This panel of folks who have been doing this for some time, this panel that looks a little bit like some of the panels from back in the day and less like some of the panels of today. And just what have you seen changing and what gives you the drive that you have and so having like so much, you have buckets of it, it's infectious, um, uh, uh, as we move forward? So I, I, I really appreciate what, what Paul has just said, and I, I fully agree. First of all, this has been, I don't know, my fifth climate week, and I won't be coming back either. I also indicated that I wouldn't go to COP um, because I do believe that it's not only rep whatever you called it, infectious repetitis, but I would also call it bullshit. <laughs> um, and I think there's a hell of a lot of it. And this technocratic, technological obsession rather than coming back to the inner, mm -hmm. is so important. So what have I seen that has changed? Mm -hmm. I, at least from everything now that we are doing in terms of not only our modeling, but the conversations that we've had, mm -hmm. the proof point is inequality and poverty. Mm -hmm. yes. It's not climate change, stupid. Mm -hmm. It's inequality and poverty. And what's changing is, and we just had a dialogue on our new report, SDG for All, with, uh, we were able to present it to the SecGen and the deputy SecGen and, his, and their entire team. And they said, absolutely, can we please bring this into the summit of the future? Mm -hmm. Not to blame or shame, but to come back to what's most essential, human dignity, for fuck's sake. Excuse my language. We have forgotten what it is to become human again. We have forgotten what it is to hold people's hands, to make sure that our economic system is servicing people, planet, and prosperity, not just shareholder value. That actually everything we do is about relationships and holding each other and loving each other, loving thy neighbor. I was with the Pope, believe it or not, three months ago, and he said, pray for me. And I said, I'll pray for you, but can we please pray for the rest of the world together? <laughs> and I'm only saying that because the inner development goals also comes from this deep, deep thinking that, and this was what Aurelia Pache wanted to do, was to have dialogues with different faiths, to have dialogues with different cultures, mm -hmm. to come back to what holds us all together that notion of trust. And if we apply that in my own career, what I've really seen is when is it that we were able to negotiate properly? When is it that we actually had those difficult conversations? It's when we got in a room, we cried together, we laughed together, we danced together, and then we trusted each other and we built mountains together. And we need to get back to trusting and loving each other. And that level of trust has left the room I mean, here, politically, it's nowhere to be seen. In Europe, we're going to have European elections. We're, we're moving towards populism, growing instability. And again, everything is anchored in the fact that people are not paying their fair share, mm -hmm. that there are some people that are in deep pain, whether it be in the South or whether it be in the North, and we have to come back to what makes us human again. Okay, I, I need a little bit of a moment. The dog loves it. The, 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 <laughs> the dog has reminded us of love this whole week. Okay, I'm going to come to questions um, from the audience and online, but just for one second before we do that, and in honour of the inner 
development goals. I just ask you, you spent a lot of time looking up here at a stage of five people, and perhaps stages and audiences might be part of the challenge with some of what we're trying to change. So could you just take a look around at the people who are sitting beside you and behind you and just give them a smile? Just give people a smile. That extraordinary, that human, that incredible thing of a smile. Um, I did without a mask. Without a mask. And, and just, just that wonderful, wonderful connection that we have. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to... to it is hard when we do these gatherings. And one of the reasons it's hard that we do these gatherings is that we're all having conversations with people who all have conversations with each other. And during this week, we've had some amazing staff here at Solutions House. We've had some security folks. We've had some catering folks. We've had the people who've done the AV. We've had the people who've moved the chairs around. And um, uh, the most wonderful Karen, who has been in charge of all of it, has been making sure that they uh, all come and attend the sessions. And the conversations we've been having back there behind the catering wall have in some ways been some of the most inspiring conversations because people have been asking me is this real like does this happen and 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 I'm um, like like so should like this this food waste thing that we're doing we should be not doing this and I don't like it when I see when people are uh, in catering sort of put the ice and try to melt it down in the sink and having these conversations with people around what they can do how they feel their fears their their engagement I'm realizing actually we have got to do something about the story but one of the things we've got to do about the story is actually make sure that other people are part of it Absolutely. because actually there is a lot of folks for whom actually they're not tired of climate week they would love to have these conversations they want to be part of it they want to tell us what they think but they aren't on this stage mm -hmm. so um a uh, uh, massive massive thanks to the sort of uh, secret climate conference that has been going on at the back um there between all the staff that have attended during this whole week we've got time for a couple of questions i'm going to keep an eye on online i think uh Yes, sir. Um, I think Cameron's going to come and... Oh, wonderful. We've got a use for the mic. There we go. If you feel able, please tell us who you are and where you're from, but you don't have to. Um, right in front of me, I see it says answers only. And now we are in Solutions House, but I need to ask a question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question which will frame the solution. And... Uh, what the uh, speakers were talking about. So my question is, what is sanctuary cities? You know, New York is a sanctuary city. Does anybody here can answer, like, what is a sanctuary city? Is that something that you, you yeah. take, being a student from New no, York? So, so what I'm trying to do is to, you know, because, like, we are here, uh, answers only, and I am supposed to ask a question, I'm framing this uh, question as a solution. So, you know, New York is a sanctuary city, and, you know, sure. the Lady Liberty raises a torch which says, give me your poor, give me your wretched, give me your huddled masses. And we have hundreds of thousands of migrants, you know, mm -hmm. who are now going, and we have 55, you know, bloody conflicts going on. And, you know, so when we are talking about mm -hmm. peace, when we are talking about, uh, you know, United Nations General Assembly, so um, I think right. the solution is, you know, because Sanctuary Cities is a legal and a financial framework, you know, which welcomes everyone. It says that when you are in a city, you are a citizen. So in terms of compassion, in terms of making space for everyone. And I think, you know, uh, if you go to the UN uh, General Assembly mm -hmm. right now going on, the Climate Week, people don't know about climate change. You know, uh, climate, uh, sorry, the sanctuary city. Sanctuary cities. And yep. United Nations Agency for Human Settlement, Habitat, it talks about smart cities, it talks about clean cities, sure. it talks about green cities, not a peep squeak on sanctuary, sanctuary cities. cities, which is actually, I, you know, addressing all the, you know, ex climate extreme conflicts. It's yep. actually addressing that situation, which is generated by our time. Great. And what is actually happening here in terms I'm of gonna solution? I'm going to take that point yes. around sanctuary cities yes. and the, so the role of welcome. So please look up uh, sanctuary city. It's a legal and a financial yep. framework. Wherever Definitely. you can raise that voice, we have to get that into the 
dialogue. Beautiful. So sanctuary cities, welcome, refugees, safety, home. Yeah, um, three thoughts. And I won't just focus on what the sanctuary city is from a legal re perspective. But first, this comes back to broadening the narrative. We are all going to become refugees. And the moment that we all realize that we are a potential refugee, maybe then we'll realize the importance of the refugees that we have today. This is the disconnect between those people and us. Mm -hmm. It's about the knowledge that we could all become in need of a sanctuary city. Point number two, we need to stop also just being thinking about cities themselves. I talk about building corridors between cities and rural communities. The disenfranchised in rural communities are the ones also that are fighting against this narrative because they don't see the benefits for them and yet they are feeling the pain, farmer communities, etc. And the third point is the, the word sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to dignity. So again, we need to think through a sanctuary city is not just about refugees. It's about the people that live in that city. I grew up in San Francisco. San Francisco is now not the city <laughs> that I knew. It is unfortunately having the highest homelessness rate, highest addiction rate, and it's now being called poop town. Now this is in the so-called American dream, mm -hmm. which has become an American nightmare for so many people. Sanctuary has to be for everyone. We need to think about a basic welfare net. We need to think about a basic income. We need to think about wealth distribution. We need to think about the economics of all becoming refugees within our own cities and our own homes. I think Stephen and then Jamie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of my favorite responses I heard from a panelist recently when they were asked, uh, what can I do as an individual about climate change? Uh, the response was, be a little less of an individual. Mm. And uh, Burlington, Vermont is a place I've lived and um, I don't live there now, but I live very close by and it is a sanctuary city. So my relationship with Burlington, Vermont in terms of how it resettles refugee communities uh, is through a really beautiful program that's called New Farms for New Americans. And it's an example of being less of an individual uh, in our mindset. Uh, when new uh, immigrants are resettled in Burlington, Vermont, from South Sudan, from Bhutan, from other places, some very high conflict zones sometimes, uh, they have the opportunity to receive a small plot of land and to grow food. And often they will bring seeds and and farming techniques that don't exist in the US, at least not in a, a widespread way. And so they bring with them wisdom from their own practices and their own mm -hmm. um, indigenous ways, wherever they may be from. Uh, one gentleman I, I, uh, I met and got to be friends with, his father's name was Tears of the Nile, uh, as an example of the sort of in tune with which uh, um, some people are, are living with their environments. So I think that that program is a beacon of hope and an example of how a sanctuary city can operate and the, uh, the relationships that it can help cultivate between people who may be from very different places and between the land and the people who are, who are established and who are just arriving. Brilliant. Actually, Jeremy, I'm going to ask you to hold because this was awesome and thank you very much for that impassioned uh, uh, beautifully put a uh, call for sanctuary cities to be seen as a core part of climate. In terms of time, I'm going to take one or two, in fact, maybe two, um, just to make sure that we're honoring the audience, um, because the time is ticking, <laughs> and we want to make sure we get... Uh, Hi, Junko Suba from Steinberg thoughts. Asset Management. I live in Michigan. Thank you so much for your candid and also... Um, Kind of bringing you back to earth uh, perspectives. Um, actually, it was one of the sessions I was most touched with out of all the climate week. Um, I would love to continue this dialogue about bringing it back to the basic of human dignity, equality. Um, I give local climate change presentations in Michigan to both Republicans and Democrats, and I think that is the key. I'd like to continue this way of thinking. Do you have any suggestions on resources or groups that have this type of dialogue? 
Brilliant. Okay, we're going to take a couple and then we're going to close out. So resources and groups, this dialogue, so, and then the gentleman at the back, and then we'll have to come back to the panel. Thank you. Please. Okay. Um, hi, Blaine Merker with Gale. We're strategists that work around the world, um, making cities more sustainable, uh, more equitable, healthier, and, and really just kinder for people. I spend a lot of my time talking to bureaucrats, talking to people who are figuring out how to pave the streets, how to deliver services, how to design cities. And I wondered if you had any suggestions for how to disrupt the pattern of how we talk in a technical way mm -hmm. to those people who are doing the work while being respectful of where they are and meeting them where they are, but still inviting up this space for a, a more profound question about the inner world. Thank you. Okay, and then we've got one more, the gentleman in the middle. Gentleman in the middle. Sir with glasses. Um, thank you for this panel. Uh, Nihar Shah, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I have two questions. I'll try to make it brief. Um, first is, yes, we're talking about mindset shift, but I think there's an external correlate around uh, having a system that requires infinite growth for people to just be our, live our lives. So just if you could say anything about that. And the second, it seems to me that this is a crisis of belonging to planet and belonging to place. And if you could say something about that in the dimensions that you're talking about, Brilliant. please. Thank you. So three wonderful questions. I'm actually going to go along the panel and ask for some final thoughts. One, Was there one more? Quick. Really quick, really quick, OK. Yeah. Brilliant. There's actually quite, there's a lot of thematics across that actually that, that are drawn out. So I'm going to pass along. We won't be able to do justice to those four questions in the final four minutes, but thank you for asking them because I think you may find answers within this room, not just on this panel. So Paul, I'm going to come to you first for some final reflections. Uh, very, very quickly, <clears throat> uh, white people, privileged people have been talking about climate in terms of future existential threat. And now they're freaked out because it came this year. It's not about future existential threat. 5.1 billion people wake up every morning with exist current existential threat that morning, and they spend their day dealing with that in all the ways in terms of income, security, food security, their children, health, where they live, etc. And the irony is that the so the solution is, and people talking about, like Occidental Pete says, they're just spending a billion dollars on direct air capture, you know, to s capture 500,000 tons of carbon from the atmosphere. It'll cost $300 million a year to operate it, and they will sequester 500,000 metric tons of carbon, which is 366 seconds of the carbon we emit every year. Mm -hmm. And that's a billion dollars, and I want to weep when I hear that. Mm -hmm. That's a billion dollars. You think of what that could do for people and oh, everywhere. And so I just want to say that if you look at the true solutions the, in terms of climate, they address the needs of the 5.1 billion people who yeah. wake up every morning with current existential threat. The pathway to healing the planet is through those meeting the needs of those people. I just agree with you so, so much. 100%. Thank you. That's fine. I'm going to pull them Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, beautifully put. <laughs> I would like to invite everyone who was moved. Let's bring in another species on our panel. We need to do Exactly. Absolutely. Wow. We only have four Stephen. minutes, people. We have four Stephen minutes. It got, it got much more comfortable up here with the dog here. Um, I would like to invite everyone who is moved to attend today to uh, join us here in New York City again in November for the Garrison in Institute's 20th anniversary forum called Metamorphosis, where there will be a lot of dialogue about changing the mindsets, like the growth mindset that underpins a lot of our economic systems. So I invite you all to join us. And I would like to just share one sentence from a poem, the beginning of a poem called Gamble on Humanity, which came to mind uh, by Aisha Siddiqua. As we think about um, the ideas of hope and, uh, and dread and other sort of future-oriented uh, language, 
What if the future is soft and revolution is so kind that there is no end to us in sight? Mm. Beautiful. Thank mm. you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so the gentleman here working with, with cities and how, how, do we, you know, how do we speak to people for whom this is really new? Um, the inner development goals is sort of developed as a kind of um, a simple communications tool, a framework that, that's there for exactly your purposes. Um, so I'd recommend yeah, checking that out as, a, as an entry point. Um, we've heard that if approved by Congress, um, the inner development goals will be included in the um, US government's climate education report coming out later this year. So the last one was in 2009, and that was shared all around the world because this is a kind of you know, landmark publication. Um, and so for the first time, the inner will be part of understanding our predicament and, and, and the solutions. And that will be used to shape um, climate education in schools as well as across civil service departments. Um, so in terms of resources for this lady's question here, um, perhaps that will be one if you can, you can wait for that. And yeah, in the meantime, I realized I didn't quite round out my op opening comments to mention the reconnection meeting the climate crisis inside out report that was sort of part of the, <laughs> the write up for this event. So for people online, uh, you, can, you can find that by, by searching um, for yeah, reconnection, meeting the climate crisis inside out, which, which looks at the intervention and, the, um, and how mindfulness and compassion can be a particular part, part of the, um, the solution. Please do, it's very recommended. Those in the room have a copy, please do. Those of you online, download just a copy. Very briefly answer this lady's question about um, to what extent meditative practices, contemplative practices, can help us turn towards the difficult. Turn towards the difficult outside, but turn towards the difficult in ourselves. It can help us to develop comfort with being uncomfortable, is often a, a phrase that people, people use. Actually, an Olympic athlete I've worked with used that phrase for the impact of his mindfulness practice. So we can turn towards the darkness in ourselves that is, that is there, and part of being a tragic human being as well as a beautiful human being. Um, and that's the work that all of us need to do. We can all be part of the change um, by doing that work. And it does ripple out to others, especially if you talk about it. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll try to quickly answer some of the other questions as best I can. Um, first, please do go to our website, and I guess this is for everyone, Earth for All. It's really, it, everything is, all the information on there is downloadable. We have narratives. We're building a movement. The more people, the better. We would love to hear your visions, et cetera. So that is one way. We're having high-level conversations, but we're also moving into citizen assemblies, to festivals, to bringing out the message to people where they are in a variety of different ways. Um, but also apolitical, which is a wonderful foundation with one of our very dear friends, Lisa Witter, doing incredible work in working with politicians, very similar, actually, to what Jamie has described. We are in an extractive economy. We do need to shift. That's part of the beauty of the narrative. Pretending that this economy is actually servicing people's needs is wrong. We have the highest growth of suicide and mental illness. Getting to people, and actually we did a survey, 74% of the G20 citizens want to move towards a well-being economy. We need to tap into that. We need to show what it means. And it means many beautiful things, and yes, there may be some sacrifice. The majority of the sacrifice will come from those who have too much. And that actually, if they went back to the essentials, they'd probably be a hell of a lot happier. So I think we can build that narrative. That is the real message. Coming to people where they are, the conversations that we're having with people on the ground is actually, if we put in place new indicators, not just productivity, we're actually valuing their work. We're valuing education. We're valuing the care economy. We're valuing social workers. We're valuing all of those that are actually driving the economies. In Europe, 98% of the European economy is built on small and medium-sized enterprises. We're going back to an economy that is servicing them, not an economy that is servicing shareholder value. And those are the messages that we need to bring and having those conversations rather than allowing for multinationals like oil companies to have huge windfall profits on the back of energy poverty, or the big industrial food companies who are doing the same. It is criminal. That is what we need to do, but we need to describe it, and we need to own it, and we need to have those difficult conversations. So I guess that's 
trying to, maybe one last little quote from Dana Meadows, if I may, who's really an amazing woman who's no longer with us and was one of the lead authors of The Limits to Growth. And she says, there is too much bad news for complacency, but there's too much good news for despair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let us remember that. Thank you. What a beautiful way to finish. Thank you so, 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 so very much. Um, uh, this is the last panel here at Solutions House, and I cannot imagine a better one in terms of actually being bringing together so many of the themes that we've had here. Um, the session before this, with the, some of the uh, music musicians and youth climate activists, um, we discovered that some of them were born the same year that I did my master's in sustainability and started on this journey. But I just took me a moment. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what it made me realize was over those years, over those decades since starting this journey, the very best part about working on this is the people, is the friendships and the connections and the sense of community and the not being alone. And when you're confronted by the horrors of the system, being able to connect with the beauty of the people that you meet everywhere in the world and you realize that actually that's what it's all about. It's all about us. It's all about the people in this room. It's all about the people online. It's all about the people who don't even know any of this are happening, but who care and want and love and live. So thank you so, so very much. I want to take just a moment, um, being this is our last session, to acknowledge Karen and to acknowledge Mapem and to acknowledge Kim, who have absolutely <laughs> pulled off something extraordinary this week. Um, Futera is not an events organization apart from the 38 events we've won in one week in Climate Week. Um, I want to acknowledge those uh, who are watching online from our team, um, particularly um, Aisha and Sarah and Gu and Miguel who have done so much of the design work here. Um, I want to thank everybody who has worked on the AV and making sure and the, and the sound and the online, those who have worked in the catering and made sure that this space has worked. Um, I've had the privilege, and it is a massive privilege, of being able to stand up here quite a lot and talk to incredible people. Um, and the reason why I've been able to do that is because other people have actually made this entire fucking thing happen. Um, and I, I am merely their puppet. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us, everybody who's been here during the week. I want to thank this person right here. She is so amazing and such a great job. Thank you. You're just the best. Oh, Paul. No, I haven't cried for a week. Not on the last panel. Let it go, Sully. Let Very it go. Tired. It's okay. Very it's okay. Tired. Okay. And also, I want to thank the, the uh, person who has made Solutions House a space that means that when people walk in, they smile, which is Tagada, a non-human person who has reminded us of what joy we can take beyond the human connection, but who is currently eating uh, possibly or possibly even part of one of the reports. So thank you so, so very much for everybody who's joined us online. Thank you so much for following on. Thank you so much to everyone who will be watching this later on. And thank you so much to those of you in the room. What a wonderful, wonderful wonderful session. Thank you.